Okay, good evening. Good evening. I just want to hit us some uh, some announcements for uh, for the next uh, next week or so in the life of our congregation. Um, don't forget on this coming uh, Wednesday night we are having a harvest party, and that's going to start at 7:30. So there's going to be a regular awana and regular prayer meeting starting at all the normal times, but at 7:30. Uh, we are going to uh, move out to the back where the fire pit is, and we have Yates Donuts and Cider and uh, a bonfire, and just a chance to get together and uh, celebrate Refor Reformation Day coming. So uh, look forward to, to that. Uh, we have been announcing uh, Redeeming Manhood, which starts or is, on, is on November 12th. And does anybody have a flyer in front of them? I forget the exact time that starts. 5.30, okay, so that'll start with, uh, with dinner. And then we'll move into two sessions with our guest speaker, Larry Roger. He spoke for us at uh, Redeeming Manhood a couple of years ago and look forward to having him come back. And so encourage all the men to block off that night on their calendar so that we uh, can, can join together and, uh, and hear instruction from God's word. 
We, do, uh, we did have a redeeming womanhood scheduled, um, but it, I was uh, unable to line up a speaker in the appropriate amount of time, so we'll probably push that uh, off till uh, the beginning of the year, but uh, looking forward to running the same uh, kind of event with, uh, with ladies as well. So stay tuned for, uh, for that. Uh, small groups next Sunday night, 6 p.m., so uh, I trust you'll hear from your small group leaders this week in terms of uh, details for that. And if you're here tonight and you are a small group leader, that's a reminder that you can uh, pass on those details to those in your small group. And then Saturday morning is a church work day at uh, 8.30 a.m. We'll start with Dunkin' Donuts and then move on to work and then finish with Little Caesars Pizza. So um, if you don't want to prepare breakfast or lunch, it's an opportunity to come uh, and, and, and do that and then just work in, in between. We have a number of tasks, both indoors and outdoors, that, uh, that need tackled. And so if you could uh, volunteer your uh, about four hours of your time, that would be tremendously appreciated uh, because there are a number of things that uh, they're a challenge to get to. Well, let's begin with our word of prayer, and then we'll uh, begin singing and song together. Father, we thank you for your love and care for us and the chance we have to gather this evening to uh, listen to the scriptures again and to join in, in, in song together. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, as uh, Pastor Mike brings the word to us, that our hearts would be encouraged and uplifted from uh, the truth of, of scripture, uh, that we would continue to understand your desires for us and, and your will uh, so that we can put it, into, uh, put it into practice and live among uh, each other in a way that honors and glorifies you and is a testimony to a lost world. Uh, Lord, there are so many things transpiring in our, in our country today uh, over which people are, are concerned, and we have the opportunity to be uh, stable, to be steadfast, to be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, not tossed to and fro by every idea that is out there and not affected by the, uh, by the tumultuous times. But Lord, let us be a consistent and joyful testimony of uh, confidence in you and your work and uh, the fact that you will one day reign and you will win. And so Lord, we're grateful to, to be on your side and we wanna be good representatives of you. So as we, as we come here tonight, let us continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord so that we can represent you well, uh, both with each other and to a lost community. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. All right, we're gonna begin this evening with the refuge that we have in Christ. Let's sing, he hideth my soul, let's all stand together. Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved, he giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns, and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my law in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He 
hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his brightness transported i rise to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation his wonderful love i'll shout with the millions on high he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand you can be seated let's sing there is a redeemer God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, hope for sinners slain. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, my for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. For our scripture reading this evening, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 11 and we'll read down to verse 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is God's word.
We'll continue with singing His Robes for Mine. You can go ahead and be seated. His robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting love, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand, with righteous works not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. God's wrath on sin then cried his done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My prayer my all shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as though I, accursed and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ Go ahead and stand before Pastor Mike comes and we'll sing, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be holy thine. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart. My zeal inspire as thou died for me. Oh, may my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. While life's dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be Thou my God, 
Amid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away. Nor let me ever stray from thee aside. When ends life's transient dream, when death's cold sullen stream shall o'er me roll. Blessed Savior, then in love, fear and distrust remove. Oh, bear me safe above a ransomed soul. You may be seated. I want to look at the topic tonight of life under the gospel, because that's where you and I are at. And the text really would be the whole New Testament. And we're not going to cover the whole New Testament, but we're going to look at portions of it. And I want to answer this question, or, or maybe not a question, but I want to give support to this statement. Our life in Christ was not made to be lived under a set of what we might call corporate expectations or church expectations as a whole. Sometimes we might call these things standards or, or personal expectations that we might set on ourselves or promises that we might make to God according to his word or in light of his word. Because in the end, those things are still what? Man-made standards. And there's something more in the gospel than that. And I'm not saying you can't have standards. But I am saying there is something more than that that we're called to. And I want to look at the Pharisees for a second, because we, we would all agree that the Pharisees ended up getting off initially because they looked at the law of Moses. And they built a hedge of their own rules around the law of Moses so that they wouldn't break the law of Moses. So it was kind of like a safeguard to make sure they never violated God's law. Problem was, focus moved off of God's law and onto the hedge that was built around the law. And over time, what happened to the hedge that was built around the law? It actually took the place of the law. So that people were living out the law of the Pharisees that they were teaching to the people around them, thinking they were actually living out the law of Moses like God intended them to live it out. And then comes Christ. And Christ ends up living out the law of Moses perfectly. He lives it out fully in its motives. He lives it out fully in its intent of what was supposed to be there on the inside. And he lives it out perfectly on the outward side. And how does the Pharisees react to Christ? He's not our Messiah. He's not going along with what we've established. The people that are hearing Christ preach are saying things like, we, we've never heard anybody speak with authority like this before. We've not heard the things that he's telling us before. And so he's at odds with the established religious people. And yet he's living out the law that they're supposed to be teaching exactly like it should be. So the law became distorted underneath them. And the New Testament Christian is intended to live out the laws, because there are, there are laws in the New Testament. We, we might call them commands. Very, very clear black and white statements in the New Testament. And we are supposed to live out, those out exactly like they're stated there. I want to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 first, because this is Paul's gateway, if you would, into sanctification. He spent 11 chapters building the doctrine of God's mercy all the way through, probably the most full, full explanation of the gospel we have in the Bible doctrinally. And now he gets to chapter 12. 
And he's going to make an appeal to all the people now. So here's how you begin to live out this Christian life. So he begins by saying this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Every, everything that he has established doctrinally about God's mercy up to this point. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Again, this is stated in a command. So, so it's something that's just very clear, very black and white. I'm to present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is my spiritual act of worship. And do not be conformed to the world. Again, a a clear command. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And we know transformation isn't something we can do on our own, but the expectation is this is what's going to occur if we follow everything else that Paul's asking us to do. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may do what? Well, that by testing, we might discern what the will of God is. And this is what I'm, I guess, trying to bring out, that God's intent is that the Christian's going to live a discerning life according to the commands that God has given. And you'll know what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. And it's going to be good for every situation we find ourselves in life because here's the difference. If I live by those standards that I set upon myself that are built around the Bible, I can't carry those into every walk of life and live out Christ like I should. They're, they're going to fall short. They're not going to really fit the situation all the time. It might make me feel more comfortable because I don't have the the messy time of trying to figure out what it is that God wants me to do in a particular situation. In my mind, I already have it set. So I just live that out in every situation. But I might fall short of what the gospel is asking me to do. I might fall short of living out Christ in that particular situation, and I could feel good about it. I could feel like because I disciplined myself to hold that thing I said I would keep before God, I could feel like I attained what God was asking me to attain. Yet again, feel short. So it might say that the standard I made is very helpful in general at times, but not always what it needs to be. Here's a case in point. I, I personally have made the standard that I, I would prefer not to have alcohol beverages in my life. You, you may have chosen something else. But that's what I chose because I think it's the best for my situation. So what do I do when I get to a foreign country? And in that foreign country, that communion table is set before me And they're passing around a little cup, and it doesn't have grape juice in it. It has wine in it. Do I drink? Or if I drink and violate my standard, does God hold me in judgment to that? Or do I, for unity within that body, and and, and so as not to interrupt their communion service, If it's not in itself sin, it's just simply the standard that I made, and in my conscience I'm wrestling, can can I take the communion cup for the benefit of those that are in that body who would have absolutely no thought process that anything difficult or anything wrong would be going on because that's what they're used to in their culture. Or if I have to be in a situation where emergency surgery has to be performed, And we're out in this bush area. And they give the person a bottle of whatever they give them to just knock them out. Do do I go along with it? Do I say absolutely not? God, God will preserve you and God will take care of your pain. But you cannot do this. I can't do that. And that's what I'm trying to say is my own standard may not always really be what it ought to be in a situation that I'm in. There's something more than that. There's something beyond that that God's given to the Christian. And it's there in Romans chapter 12. He says to be yielded first because here's three prerequisites. You could say really more like four. 
to really understanding and knowing God's wills in particular situations. The, the first is where I'm at in my heart. He says to present yourself as a living sacrifice. And present gives the idea of yielding. And, and the verbiage isn't just a one-time decision. I, I used to have the understanding that I would have this monumental decision in my life. There was salvation, and then at another point, I just dedicate my life to God, and that's where I become serious about living for God. Yet my understanding has come that this, this verb here causes me to know that this is a presentation of myself that happens continually. I am always presenting myself and needing to present myself to God as a living sacrifice daily and throughout the day as I'm going about life. And this is my act of worship. And also as part of this prerequisite said is number two, I can't be conformed to the thinking of the culture around me. Doesn't mean I can't live according to my culture. I don't have to be odd in that culture. But I can't be conformed to its philosophies. I can't be conformed to its way of thought where it disagrees with the gospel. And we might say today that culture is very much permeating Christian society around us. So that right and wrong becomes distorted in many ways. And I also, number three, have to renovate my mind. The, the idea of renewing the mind. It's the idea of literally gutting the mind out. Uh, if you ever did a construction project. project where you had to gut everything out and basically reshape it. That's what I'm supposed to be doing with my mind with the Word of God. I'm literally gutting out what is there, and I'm replacing it with the Word of God so that it is renovating the way that I think. L literally making new the way that I think so that it's more conformed to the Word of God and not influenced by the culture that's around me. Because culture around me is strong. And my desire to fit in with that culture is strong. And yet God is telling me not be, to be conformed to it, but to be renewed or renovated in my mind. It's interesting. Um, we, we can go into bookstores, Christian bookstores, and you can find all sorts of ideas about what this looks like. And I like this quote by Vody Bachman that said this. He says, all Christian bookstores should have a disclaimer about the content of the books in their store, that it's not necessarily expressing the thoughts of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying don't trust everything that's in a Christian bookstore. It's not all centered on the Word of God. Full of Christian self-helps, full of ways of how to make your church more attractive to people around you, full of all sorts of easy steps to having a solid Christian family, and the list goes on. But we have within us a life of God that desires the Word of God. And through surrender to the Word that we know, one step at a time, that obedience then is really tantamount to walking in the Spirit. That's how we're supposed to live our Christian life. And this process, this daily process, is what's supposed to equip us to be able to prove or approve what is God's will in particular situations and what is holy and what is right and good and acceptable. And Paul goes on to say that you might test or that you might discern what the will of God is. So you discern through testing, through grabbing hold of it and evaluating it and make comparison to it with the word of God. So if I go through my life and I only work hard at conforming to what I have developed as expectations for Christian life, you can call them standards, you can call them whatever you want. I could very well grow on the outside so that people who are evaluating my life would say, hey, he is lining up with all the expectations. Therefore, we have a mature Christian sitting in front of us. And the reality was, I, I could be 30 years a Christian 
and be very disciplined in my endeavor to hold these expectations and be immature as a Christian. 30 years knowing God, but still be immature in my Christian walk with God. You, you may come to grips with people who have been able to do that, but yeah, they can't control their temper. Yet there's other areas of life that are so out of line with the gospel. But because these expectations have been kept, everything's good on the outside. But the transformation that only comes with yielding oneself to the word of God isn't taking place like it ought to. And God is asking that we end up coming through this process to discern through testing. We, we know also from the book of Colossians that anything that we bind ourselves to does not have the ability to transform the flesh. In fact, Colossians 2, 20 through 23, he's, he's encouraging the Colossian people. And he says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulations? And these are regulations that the false teachers are asking them to submit to. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Those are also in the law of Moses for those that are being encouraged to go back into the law of Moses. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These all indeed have an appearance of wisdom, of promoting self-made religion and asceticism, the denying of self or the squashing down of self and on the outward side of things it looks like wisdom and there's severity to the body but they're of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh there's no transformation that takes place they have no ability to put to death the deeds of the flesh and there's going to be a danger in all this because when you say this statement and you take away standards. Or in Paul's case, he's dealing with churches all through the New Testament where he's teaching that the law of Moses has been taken away from them. It's no longer necessary for the Christian life. What's the natural result when you take away a law? Well, there's just going to be freedom. <laughs> there's going to be complete license to do as one pleases. And so we might make this statement that grace and freedom from the law will have a tendency to cause abuses so that we can justify selfishness. In other words, listen, you can't tell me I can't do this from Scripture. So I believe that I can do this. And the reality is, if I really got down to the core of it, I'm doing what I'm doing because it's what I want to do. And I'm doing it for self purposes. Galatians 5.13 says this, for you were called to freedom, brothers, freedom from the law of Moses, freedom from being enslaved to sin, freedom to serve Christ as we ought to. You were called to freedom, brothers, but don't use this freedom, don't use this lack of being bound by the law of Moses as an opportunity for your flesh. But, and this is going to be key in all this, through love, do what? Serve one another. So Paul's going to call us to a higher standard, and self's not part of it. Philippians 2, in verse 3, says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Black and white statement in the New Testament. No argumentation on it. No clarification needed. He's just simply saying, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit. Could you imagine what life would look like if we were able to live that out? And Paul's saying, you are. We won't, <laughs> but he's saying you are. So it's a command, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests 
of others. This, this is transformational. And yet we, we cry and people cry. All through the New Testament, Paul's dealing with people that are crying, but Paul, we have rights. We, we have personal authority, if you would, in some of these areas. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul, Paul's answering that cry. He's saying, all things are lawful for me, and this, this is the thought process of the Corinthian people as they're arguing with Paul. Everything's lawful to us, Paul. And Paul's saying, okay, let's take that statement. So, some of your newer translations will have quotation marks around that. To, to help us understand, Paul's most likely quoting them. Okay, I'll accept your premise. All things are lawful for me. And then he has a but to it. But here's some things that have to be considered, even though you might think you have this freedom or this right. But not everything's helpful, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me. But Paul says, I'm not going to be dominated by anything. I'm not going to allow anything that has control over me to be part of my life. It goes on to say in verse 23 of chapter 10, all things are lawful, same quote. And again he says, but not helpful. All things may be lawful, but not all things build up. So Paul's saying that those things that I choose that build others up, and those things I choose not to do because of their power to enslave me, are much greater than the freedom I have to say, hey, you can't say I can't do this. Because you can't give me any scripture that says definitely I can't. So therefore I can. And so all day long we're, we're making decisions on one set of premises or another. And everything then boils down to decisions that we make. And what if the decisions that we make are off? And they're off just by a little bit. And we've come to hold them then as the way we govern our life. Anton Roundy, real, real name, he makes this statement in an article that he writes. And he's not writing in the idea of Christianity. He's, he's writing in the idea of business. But it has a principle for us. He says, I've been thinking lately about the big differences little things make. Consider this. If you're going somewhere and you're off course by just one degree after one foot, you'll miss the target by 0.2 inches. Trivial, right? But what about as you get farther out? After 100 yards, you'll be off by 5.2 feet. Not huge, but noticeable. After a mile, you'll be off by 92.2 feet. One degree is starting to make a difference. After traveling from San Francisco to L.A., you'll be off by six miles. And if you're trying to get from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., you would end up on the other side of Baltimore, 42.6 miles away. And if you travel around the globe from Washington, D.C., you would miss by 40, 435 miles and end up in Boston. In a rocket going to the moon, you'd be 4,169 miles off, nearly twice the di diameter of the moon. And if you tried to go to the sun being one degree off, you'd miss by over 1.6 million miles, nearly twice the diameter of the sun. And if you tried to travel to the nearest star, which I think the sun is, but I understand what he's saying, you'd be off course by over 441 billion miles. 120 times the distance from the earth to Pluto, or 4,745 times the distance from earth to the sun. And his point is, over time, a mere one degree error in course makes a huge difference. And he's talking to businessmen as they plot out their business, yet the same thing's true as we plot out our Christian life. So how does this discernment that we're being asked to do work? I want to look at three aspects of that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 made this statement. But test everything and hold fast what is good. And abstain from every form of evil, or evil in all of its forms, however you find it. 
Some, some translations use the word evil in all of its, the appearance of all evil, avoid it. And again, that translation was a little bit unfortunate. It's a translation I grew up with. And from that translation, with, without doing our homework, we ended up coming up with things like this, and this is part of how I lived my life. Okay. I need to be really careful that nothing I do gives the appearance that it could be something wrong. So from that came the standard that we would not go into a movie theater. And I'm not saying everything in the movie theater is beneficial. That's a whole different question. But we wouldn't go into the movie theater because there were five different movies going on. And if I did, nobody would know which one I went to. We could have been seeing Million Dollar Duck, and that, that dates me. Or we could have been seeing something that was really bad. And nobody would know as I walk out. Therefore, do not go in because it gives the appearance that you might be doing something that's evil. But you know what happened when videos came out and video stores came out? Same thing sitting in there. Nobody knows what video I'm getting. But we didn't say you can't go in a video store. We just said you can't go into the movie theater. Our, our standard broke down and it didn't fit the situations, and we didn't have it based on the right things. And the idea here is to test everything, everything. So what does it mean to test everything? The meaning here quotes, one, I quote one person, that they were carefully to examine everything proposed for their belief. They were not to receive it on trust or to take it on, <coughs> excuse me, assertion. To believe it because it was urged with vehemence, vehemence and zeal or plausibility. In the various opinions and doctrines which were submitted to them for adoption, they were to apply the appropriate tests from reason and the Word of God. In other words, reasonably dividing the Word of God and what they found to be true, they were to embrace. And what was false, they were to reject. In other words, there was going to be a, a black and white response as they took everything that was proposed to them as doctrine from the Bible and evaluated it with the Word of God. They either embraced that or they were to reject that. And so this is the first aspect of discernment. Is it a complete and clear right and wrong statement that's being made in the Bible? Here, here's, for me, is probably the clearest passage of both things that I'm going to talk about. The black and white statement and the discernment that comes from a black and white statement. Pastor Joey already preached on this in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, so I'm not, I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to use it as an example. It says, for this is the will of God. So, so no argumentation now. This is just God's will and as this gospel gets taken to all different cultures, this is going to be God's will. And it may actually change some cultures. It will definitely change the culture in Thessalonica. And it's okay if it changes that culture because cultures have to submit to the Bible. And Christians have to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So he says this, this is the will of God, even your sanctification or set-apartness, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So that's the black and white, and we know the black and white. But look down a couple more verses, 1 Thessalonians 4.4. 4. He says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles, who don't know God. That's how we used to live life. That no one transgress, and here, here's the command, but the command takes discernment. That no one transgress and wrong or defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord's the avenger of all this. So at what point do I as a fellow Christian in this particular situation def defraud a fellow Christian? Maybe I could say it like this. At what point does my interaction with another Christian 
cause them to believe there is something they can have from me that I cannot righteously give them in this area of thought. I defraud. I take advantage of. So at what point does that happen? Black and white standard we can give? This one's left for discernment. And love is going to be key to how we go about coming to a conclusion. And principles of scripture are going to come into bear as we try and determine how do I operate now in this realm. Where I am careful not to do anything that would cause a sister, if I'm a man, or a sister in relation to a man, to think that I am giving something to them that I righteously can't. So love of Christ and love of others become a primary motivation now. Look at Philippians 1.9. Is it right or wrong? Well, the scripture tells us what right or wrong is. But it doesn't in that other verse we just looked at. So I think this is what, what Paul has for us to make the decision in the realm where it's not black and white. He says in Philippians 1.9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So, so love and affection for Christ. And by extension, there's going to be affection to others. There's, there's no way around it. If someone is loving Christ, they are going to love others. We have to grow in abundance. This is a black and white command. We don't have choice in this matter. We are supposed to be growing in this. But there's guiding limitations to the affection and the growth of the affection. It's got to be in knowledge. It's not just this, this feeling that we have and this overwhelming desire to just, just be real concerned about each other. It's directly connected to the knowledge we have of Scripture because that's going to guide us in what this love looks like. And it's going to guide our judgment. It's going to guide how we discern and operate in some of these areas that are not black and white. In other words, self is going to get taken right out of the picture in this regard. Now, knowledge here is more than just knowing stuff. It's knowledge through experience. It's putting what we have come to know into action in our discerning process. What one commentator makes this statement, a Christian can have an understanding or they can have knowledge of the word that is be able to explain its meanings to others without having an experiential knowledge of the same. In other words, they can explain, here's what the Bible says, but they really can't give gospel or they really can't give counsel on the living of it out because the living of it out isn't something that's happening in their life to any real degree. But when the Christian has put the word of God into practice in his life, then he has what Paul is talking about here. This is the difference between a young convert and a matured believer. The extent to which what is known is put into action is the difference between the young convert and the reason he doesn't or she doesn't have a lot of experience is what? They're a new convert. But the Christian saved many years should, should have a bundle of experience in putting these things into practice and much to offer in wisdom because of it. The former has not had time to live long enough to live out the word in his life, and the latter has. So Paul says this in, in, in conclusion. We're going to have to choose what's best. In other words, determine what is definitely right Determine what is definitely wrong, and these are non-negotiable. These change cultures, no matter where we take the gospel. But there are these areas where we just don't know for sure. And there are these areas where we're going to have to discern, and Paul's giving this, this command, that ye may approve things, in verse 10 of Philippians 1, that you may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So what does it mean to approve things that are excellent? 
The, the, word, the word things that are excellent, excellent actually means to carry two ways. To carry different ways. Thus to differ. In other words, it's something that is differing in opinions. Differing in positions. C could be taken different ways. And Paul says in this area of things that can be taken different ways, he's commanding that we take that which is going to be the most beneficial, that which is going to be the best, not, not for me personally, but what's going to be the best for the cause of Christ and what's going to be the best for people that are in my life. In fact, one commentator makes a statement. It, it refers here to those moral and spiritual concepts and actions which involve delicate and keen distinctions. Those that require a deep and keen discernment to recognize. It's not the ordinary, everyday, easily understood spiritual ob obligations. Don't steal. Don't kill. But the finer points of Christian conduct are in the apostle's mind. We, we might call them gray areas, undetermined areas. And Paul's saying choose what is excellent between those things that may differ. And the question is, how excellent is excellent? I mean, I'll drive you nuts. When we were working through this with the college and, and career Wednesday night, I was telling my son and I were having a discussion about this, and he said, Dad, that, that will drive me nuts. And I remember being at a youth activity, an evangelistic um, get-together. There's about 1,000 young people there. And as the evangelist was preaching, he was preaching on many different topics. And as he was giving the invitation, he gave the invitation on the topics that he had preached about. Then he began giving an invitation for people to come forward on things he hadn't talked about. And one of them was their daily discipline in life. And he asked the question, how many of you are praying as much as you should? How many of you are witnessing as much as you should. How many of you are in the word as long as you should be every day? And an interesting thing started happening behind me. I had two or three of the young people go, Pastor Mike, I don't know what to do because I am trying to get in the word every day and I am praying every day, but I don't know if I'm doing it as long as I could. In other words, they're going, I'm praying a half hour each day. And the evangelist is saying, can you do more? Yeah, you could pray 45 minutes each day. And now there's guilt. In other words, the invitation was not fair. It wasn't what Paul was intending. Because you can always pray more. And you can always read your Bible more. And you always can do some other things that are disciplines of the Christian life more. That's not exactly what Paul's trying to say. He doesn't want to drive us nuts. I think the passage that Brent uh, read to us gives us the answer. So what, what is the standard then for the Christian in this? I'm going to say there's only one. And that's Christ-likeness. That's it. That's the whole, that is the whole standard of the Christian life in the New Testament. Until it says in verse 13 of Ephesians 4, you know, he, he gives evangelists and teachers and pastors for the church to equip the church until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To what extent? To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the goal of the New Testament life under the gospel. We know from Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also pretested to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, we know that's God's desire in the New Testament for us. So he goes on to say in verse 15 of chapter 4, so rather speak the truth in love. Speak what is true, not only according to the word, but what is true to the situation as you have properly discerned it. We are then to grow up in every way, all facets, unto him who is the head, unto Jesus Christ. This is the goal. 
of the Christian life. New Testament has approximately 1,050 very clear do and don't statements. So, so you thought people under the law had it bad with 600 and some laws. 1,050, and I, th I think there's more. I've seen up to 1,300 some. So depending on how they crisscross and all that. Either way, there's a lot of do and don't statements in the Bible that we're responsible for. But there's only one standard in the outcome. And where it becomes particularly essential is in those situations within the New Testament life that we do not have a clear do and do statement. Where we're taught to discern. And I think if you say Christ is the goal, it makes a whole difference on how you go about it. Kind of like this. If we looked at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31 and 32. So try this this week. Re really concentrate just on this set of commands. These are non-negotiable. We can't alter them in any way. They're very, very clear. But, but you watch how difficult it is at times to discern living them out in your daily Christian life. Ephesians 4.31, in, in the negative it's stated... Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, clamor is like noise, disorder. Uh, one, one commentator says high words such as men use when they're in a brawl or they're fighting with each other. And, and slander be put away from among you. So, so n none of that at all. Just, just put it all away. Along with all malice, evil of every kind. So that's a big command. And we're supposed to live this out each and every day with consciousness. And this is only one verse in the Bible. And that follows up with verse 32. And be kind to one another. Or show kindness to one another. Which, which would be what? It's, it's not just baking a cake and bringing it to their house. Although that would be a nice thing to do. In this realm, it's more do those things that are spiritually of benefit to fellow Christians around you, to one another. So, so is what I'm deciding to do beneficial for those around me in its effect as they have contact with me? Be, be kind one to another. Tenderhearted, compassionate towards one another. How do you build compassion towards one another? Uh, again, this this book that we're reading really, really challenged me in this area. When the gentleman writing the book made the comment that something like this is a supernatural relationship. In other words, there's nothing about the person itself that causes me to have compassion towards them except that they're a fellow Christian in Christ. And that, that in itself is what causes compassion towards that person. And again, he, he claims this is supernatural, and I would tend to agree with him. I'm not bound to the person in any other way but that. So be kind to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate towards one another, and then forgive one another, as God in Christ forgave us. So, so just look at those two verses and just say, okay, I'm going to consciously, I'm going to consciously live these out this next week. I am going to consciously before God let the command be the command and nothing but the command. And it sounds scary when you say, and you can get rid of everything else. The commands of God are completely sufficient in themselves. And God wrote them so that we would live them out in the New Testament. And I may still have my, my guardrails, but my guardrails never usurp the command. The command's the ultimate. And ask God that he might give us a yielded spirit 
so the Spirit of God can help us do these things that are completely impossible for us to do on our own from the inside out. And that's the transformation that Romans 12 is really driving at. It's a transformation on the inside that begins to show itself on the outside. And it just looks more and more like Christ. And this is the goal of living underneath the gospel. Lord God, we do. We thank you for your word. And yet, if we only had your word and not the new life that you put in us, we we would be helpless to carry it out. And Lord, if you only gave us your word, but you were not the vine that gives us the nourishment, we'd be incapable of doing anything. And if you only gave us your word, but not the spirit to empower, again, dear God, we would be helpless And so we're asking that you would help us to yield ourselves, to give ourselves up to your word and obedience to it, that through the power of your spirit, we might be able to live out these commands to your honor and to your glory and to a recognition of your lordship in our lives. And we would be grateful and thankful. In your name we pray. Amen.